to Orthodox Christian Television. My name is Father Christodoulos. I have uh, Vasily Biniaris with me and my friend Michael Halford. We're going to uh, change the format of Orthodox Christian Television uh, quite a bit. We're not going to do uh, lectures anymore. We're going to do basically book reviews. We're going to take Orthodox Christian spirituality in print, in books, and we're going to review these books and discuss them and explore the ideas that are in the books. We decided to start this series with a book that had a profound effect on my life, and I think on Michael's life and on Vasily's life as well. The name of the book is Frank's Romans, Feudalism and Doctrine, an Interplay Between Theology and Society by Father John S. Romanides. This book, uh, I'll show it to the camera, is the book that we're talking about today. It's a very... Uh, unwieldy title, Franks, Romans, Feudalism and Doctrine, an interplay between theology and society. We're going to discuss this book and uh, explore how it had, uh, why it had such a deep effect on uh, our lives. I'll begin by uh, giving quickly a uh, brief synopsis of the thesis of the book, which is uh, that the schism between Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity, or the Western part of the Roman Empire, and the eastern part of the Roman Empire was not a schism really at all between uh, a Greek East and a Latin West. It was not a schism between Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox. It was not a schism between a mainly Greek Byzantine Empire and a mainly Latin Roman Empire in the West. It was nothing of the kind. According to Father John the Romanides and according to the historical sources, the schism really was a split between Romans in the East, what was left of the Roman Empire in the eastern part of the, of the Roman Empire, and the Frankish conquerors, those Franks who conquered the Romans in the West. The Franks came in from their Germanic homelands, the Franks being a Germanic Teutonic tribe of illiterate barbarians. They came in from uh, their, their German homeland and conquered the sophisticated uh, civilization of the Romans in the West. And when they did this, uh, they set up the false historical lie that the empire in the East was now Greek and therefore heretical, and that the empire in the West was the Holy Roman Empire or was what was left of the Roman Empire. So uh, I'll let, uh, the, open up the conversation now to the three of us, but basically the Frankish, uh, Frankish uh, West and a Roman East is what Father John Romanides is explaining in this book, not a Latin West and a Greek East. So, uh, did I explain the thesis uh, too yeah. simply, or uh, you want to pick it up from here, anywhere? I mean, when I first heard this, this blew me away. When I first read this book, I never heard anything like this. And, and growing up in, in uh, America and going to high school and junior high, you know, we learned about the Greeks and the Romans, and, and we always thought that the Greeks and the Romans were two different things. And now, I understand that to be a Greek is to be a Roman, and to be a Roman is to be a Greek, and, and any part of the Roman Empire that you were in, whether you were a Celt or a Hispanic or an African, you, you were a Roman and you were Orthodox and you had a Greek culture that you were surrounded by within a Roman political system. Similar to like, uh, we're, you're an uh, English American, uh, Anglo-Saxon American, I'm a Greek American, or we're Greek Americans, or Italian Americans. You had Ro Greek Romans, Latin Romans, African Romans, Celtic Romans. And this is what Father John is talking about and it was this, uh, propaganda ploy that Charlemagne and the Franks uh, started in order to divide and conquer the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and, a, and a big part of that also is, uh, other than the propaganda and the educational you know, methodology being used to, to uh, propagate that, that whole belief, uh, also there's another aspect to it is that basically we sometimes assume inherently that things have always been in the past the same way they are today. And today you have a Latin Western, a Western Christianity and a so-called Greek Eastern Christianity, and you kind of just assume that that's the way it was. And that's what's also taught in the educational system. And, uh, you know, also 
you summed it up perfectly. That was basically the major shock factor initially with reading this book and uh, with fa what Father John says as far as the uh, uh, oneness of the Roman Empire and its, and its belief system as well and its faith. Well, what, what do you think of that when he says that, that the Romans were really Greeks and that the Greeks were really Romans? I mean, what does that mean? What is that all about? I mean, I always thought that the Romans were Romans and the Greeks were Greeks. Well, it's hard to swallow it first, yeah, Romans because that's Latin, how you... Greeks right. spoke Greek. Yeah, but unfortunately Michael. for those that propagate this myth of the Latin East and the, I mean, the Latin West and the Greek East, uh, the record of history shows that the Greek was spoken all throughout the empire, that most of the people were bilingual or trilingual, they spoke several languages, and that Greek uh, was the lingua franca, the, the language of culture for most uh, of the, uh, the, Roman, the population. Roman population, which surprised me. Because if you think about it, Paul the Apostle's writing an epistle to the Romans. If the Romans were a Latin-speaking people, as the Frankish historians claim, why did he choose to write his epistle in Greek, not Latin? That's a good question. Absolutely. His letter to the Romans is written in Greek. Greek. All, all his letters are written in Greek, even to the Galatians. So the Galatians were a Romanized Celtic people living not in Ireland, but in, in today's uh, Turkey. So you would presume that uh, yeah, if the he people write it specifically to the Romans, Romans. You, you think he'd specifically write, he would write in Latin. So clearly the evidence shows that the Latin, to be Latin was not necessarily to be a Roman. And to be a Ro Roman, it, he explains in another paper of his, but he, he does talk about it in this book too, that there was never an identity uh, of Romans with Latin. Latin and Roman was not really the, the same thing. In fact, he explains that the Romans actually fought the Latins at one point. So really then, what, what, why did uh, the Roman Empire not call itself a Greek Empire? I mean, what, what I'm trying to get at here is, what, and what, what I'm trying to remember is my first confusion when I first read this book, the first uh, confusion that set in the first time I read it, because that's really what happened to me. When I first read this book, uh, it was about 10 years ago, and it really... Well, the Greeks primarily were identified as the pagans, those that worshipped the pagans. When paganism was defeated by... Well, let's go back to when they were both, to every, when everyone was a pagan. Let's start with the Roman Empire when it was pagan. So you couldn't say that to call somebody a Greek was to call them a pagan rather than a Christian. Let's go before the church started. Let's go to pagan times. Well, was there a Roman people and was there a Greek people that were not Maybe prior to Rome conquering the Greek Empire. They're, they're, okay. So but when Rome conquered the Greek Empire, it, be, it became Greek. It essentially was Hellenized. Yes. Greekized. For those who, so which, is, which is something about you know, that you don't, when you study uh, history, they don't tell you this. Right. And, and also the, the term you just used, although probably understood a lot more clearly by most of the viewers, is also inaccurate, you know, Hellenized versus Greekized. Well, I use the word Greekized because some people don't it's understood. It's understood. Hellenized. Right, Hellen right. Hellenized. Being Hellenic is being Greek. So right. let's keep the terminology clear. So, and another reason also I think the shock factor, you know, you're, you're trying to uh, understand why you were shocked initially. I don't know about yourself personally, but also as a you know, young Greek American when I first learned of this, and I basically uh, traced the root of my shock. Basically, there's a big gap many times in, in the historical timeline. You basically have ancient Greece, and then you have post-1821 Greece, and what it is to be a Greek as far as nation, uh, nationality is concerned. And you miss that whole interim, uh, which is the Roman period, the Hellenized Roman period. which is basically blowing the American experiment out of water. You know, a lot of people will say the span from East Coast to West Coast has been one of the greatest experiments of time, but basically in order to assimilate, to come to the United States and, and be a, a member of this great experiment, you basically have to assimilate into the American culture and language and, and so forth. Whereas you had Rome, and although Hellenic was, you know, widely used amongst many of the people, okay. you did have different cultures and different languages being used, yet... Uh, being unified under a, a Roman Greco... Administration. In other words, it became a Greco-Roman world. Exactly. In other words, uh, I think what, what Father John is saying in this book is uh, the Latins who founded the city of Rome, I mean, the, the Romans who founded the city of Rome, were a branch of the... Uh, were a Latin tribe. Yeah. They were one of the tribes of the Latins who founded a city that they called Rome, and this city basically had a Hellenic culture. This particular group of Latins, not all the Latins became Hellenized. No. This particular group of Latins who founded the city of Rome were Hellenized. They adopted, I mean, I remember in junior high school, when we did the Greek chapter, then we went to the Roman chapter, 
the gods were the same, but they just changed the names. Mm -hmm. From you know, Zeus became Jupiter. Right. You know, and Dionysius, Zeus Pater, yeah. Dionysius became Bacchus. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the names weren't even changed. So uh, they wore togas. They wore. They had columns with a triangle on top for their buildings. You know, they had uh, uh, some variations in architecture, but almost nothing. Maybe they built. They invented the aqueduct. They they had basically uh, the, the alphabet, the Greek alphabet. They had, uh, did some variation on it. So basically, the the city of Rome was a uh, Greco-Roman city, and that these uh, now Romans went and conquered the whole world with the Hellenic culture. They, and when they actually came upon the ancient Greeks, they basically just assimilated with them and, and, and incorporated them into their empire that grew and became enormous. So it was really a... That's a, why in what the West calls later Byzantine times, the actual language of the Roman Empire, which was which was called uh, Romaic. Gr Romaic. Oh, so the, in other words, the Byzantines didn't say that they spoke Greek. No. They called their language Romaic, Romaic even though we would call it Greek. Yes. Even though, even though it is Greek, they didn't call themselves Greeks. No, and they called the language they spoke Roman. They called their language no, Roman. Nor, nor did they call themselves Byzantine either. Then back a little further, sure. before the term Byzantine came up, the the Roman Empire in the East, as Father John in this book explains, when the Franks conquered the, the western half of the Roman Empire. They uh, came up with a label for the rest of the Roman Empire that they hadn't conquered yet. They hadn't conquered, really, the vast and most powerful and most wealthy part of the empire, which was in the east. The Roman Empire that was free and still uh, an independent empire, they, had, they came up with a new, a new name for it, a label for it, which was Greek. They started calling it Greek, and they started calling themselves the Romans. Why would they pick the name Greek, Michael? I mean, what, what was the point of the Franks? First of all, what was the point of that? Uh, because by that time, by the time they had conquered, Greek had come to mean in the popular vernacular pagan and heretic. So they were, in other words, they were calling the Romans heretics. Her yes. In other words, to try and maybe uh, claim that they weren't really Romans. That's because, right. Because to be a Roman was to be a Christian. That's right. To be a Greek was to be a pagan. So to call somebody a Greek was to be an, it was a great insult, more than an insult. It was to call them, to call them a heretic. Yeah. So Charlemagne who was the, the great father of the Franks, uh, was the one who began this great lie of uh, calling the Romans in the East the, uh, the Greeks. And then later, the term Byzantine. And it's also, it's also ironic to know why they were, they were tagged this, this uh, classification of being Greek, you know, connotating heretic, is basically for staying st steadfast in the Christian faith as it was uh, to that point. Uh, basically, the, it was uh, it was a sour grapes um, way of saying you're not accepting our innovations. Therefore, I mean, they basically started uh, displacing the bishops of the areas. Well, displace I think is too kind. Of <laughs> <laughs> what uh, word would you use, Michael? Torture and murder would yeah. probably be a far more accurate. A, a great mm -hmm. a purge, a, uh, yeah, a, a purge. Stalinist type purge. They came in and then and in fact they divided the spoils. They uh, gave the control of these various bishoprics to their. Buddies, they're conquering fellow warlords. Fellow, fellow warlords. Yeah. They set up uh, uh, castles and, and castles, and they wholesale moved the populations out of the cities into the uh, countryside. They built walled for, uh, fortresses to keep them in, and they created the beginnings of the feudal system. So the feudal system in Western Europe. This is what really blew me away. This is really because up until then, I, I never really could understand when I was a kid in junior high school thinking. You had these masses of serfs working in the fields, and you had this one guy and his family living in this beautiful <laughs> castle. H how did he get in that castle, and who helped him build it? Right. You know, how, how, how was he able to, to get the masses of the people to uh, allow him to be in this position? You know, we were never taught that, that it was basically a, a conquering army that had come in and set up the system, and that these right. people were basically what was left of the free Roman Christians that were now being enslaved on really slave labor camps, which is really what life was like. In the, in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, like living like a slave, really slave labor camps set up by the Franks, and you had the bishops, on the one hand, uh, who were former Frankish warlords, keeping the people in fear of going to hell, and on the other hand, you had the, uh, the duke and his knights keeping the people uh, uh, from going, uh, in fear of going <laughs> to hell sooner than they really, uh, w will be if they just live a uh, normal life, which at that time was maybe 30 or 40 years, and then you were dead. And that's how these popular terms like villain, i.e. the person that lived in the villa, which was the name of the slave labor camp, became the villain. And, and the word Frank, which uh, Honest uh, and straightforward. Became, right, came right. to mean everything positive. 
-hmm. In fact, uh, you think about we get the word franchise, i.e. to be made free from the word Frank. To become a Frank. To become a Frank. In other words, if you were a Roman, you were still without your franchise. You That's were still right. not a Frank and you were still a slave. And the same term is also applied in America as well in the uh, earlier days of our nation with slavery as well. Because people talk about the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages didn't happen accidentally. The Dark Ages were dark because the Franks wanted them dark. They mm -hmm. wanted education. They literally wanted to obliterate an indigent culture to destroy all traces of the Roman Greek culture from the, the conquered people. Well, things, but why did the Franks want to obliterate all traces of Rome? Because there were repeated the Orthodox Christianity. there were repeated rebellions and uh, and there were repeated revolutions. There were repeated attempts by the oppressed people to throw off their Frankish warlords, and these were aided and fomented by that part of the Rome, uh, Roman Empire which was still free. Constantinople. Uh, yes, and, and also at the at the fall of Constantinople. Now that you mentioned Constantinople, it's interesting. Uh, hopefully, hopefully my memory serves me correct. When uh, the emperor at the time, Constantine Palaiologos, the city was basically falling, collapsing around them, and uh, assistance was being offered from the West. Of course, uh, with uh, with the one condition that he basically uh, subjugate himself to the West and the Western yeah. emperor and the Pope. And, uh, adopt the Frankish religion. Exactly, and he basically refused that, saying that he'd rather live x x amount of years under the Islamic rule, the Ottoman rule. Well, I think the expression is better the Turkish, better we wear the Turkish turban than the Frankish. Absolutely, Diana. that's where it comes from. Better, Which shows you the Turk magnitude, than, right? Better Turk than Frank. Right. Which shows you the magnitude of what a Roman at that time thought. Uh, Becoming a Frank, how horrible that was. Absolutely. It's the same pattern after the Khmer Rouge conquered in Cambodia. They moved everyone out into the uh, out countryside. The cities, into the countryside. And they killed all the intellectuals. And the Cambodia went into the Dark Ages. And they went into the Dark Ages. It was the same pattern. It was the same uh, obliteration of a culture. That's interesting. Khmer Rouge is a French word, which is a, has a Frankish, a French language has Frankish roots. I don't know if there's any connection there, but the Cambodians speak French, don't yes. they? Yes. I'm, I'm making a leap. I'm making a leap. But I, 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 maybe not so much of a leap, because European, Western European culture really is an oppressive, elitist, uh, racist kind of a culture. I mean, it's got its great moments. Mozart, and I mean, I'm, trying sure. to, I'm not trying to denigrate. We're not trying to denigrate here Western culture as a whole. We're not trying to do that because Western culture has, uh, uh, has evolved and has become uh, one of the great cultures of, of the earth. But in its Frankish, early, in, 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 at its worst, in its Frankish form, it's really dark and... Yeah, busy. but you know, all the evils that people think about Western culture, you know, the racism, the idea of, su of superiority, the, uh, the mm -hmm. class and structure, the uh, you know, the, right, cl the cl in, uh, class structure of uh, elite and uh, subjugated. Subjugate. Yeah. All of this has its roots in, in the Frankish occupation of the w Western Roman Empire. Uh, Michael's correct. And also another aspect of this is, and, and it's very uh, scary, you speak of the Dark Ages, I mean, when you, when you utilize something as strong and powerful as the name of God to implement these policies, you know, it's very far-reaching in the sense that you eliminate the, uh, the knowledgeable people, the intellectual people of your society. The Romans at the time pushed out, subjugated in these feudalistic societies, little villages called, you know, and they were called villains. And then basically the lower class people, the people who weren't as intellectually advanced, basically are scared out of their wits mm -hmm. to believe that God is going to damn them for all eternity if they don't basically do what's, uh, what's being dictated to them by the bishops or the, the military rules of the time. It's very scary and, and could have that effect of the, uh, the Dark Ages, and I think the issue becomes human freedom as opposed to, you know, which culture is better or not. I think that's really a whole other discussion, but it's really the human freedom well, we at can the say stake. That. We can say some cultures are better oh, than Absolutely. I, I don't think but if this say, a that's not being a racist. No, no, not at all, not at all. Maybe a culturalist, right. but, <laughs> but go ahead. But I'm just saying the point, the point at hand here is, is basically also to a large degree human freedom. And uh, we speak so much of that today that it's basically shunned, it's never discussed, that uh, the Dark Ages were basically a dark age for the human soul. And basically, you know, you mentioned earlier the therapeutic process was taken away from the face of this earth. Uh, the that, uh, Pontius Pilate, getting back to a biblical example, Pontius Pilate uh, in all likelihood spoke Greek as most of the Roman officials because the language of culture in that part of the world was Greek. Or in the, the, all of the civilized world, or in the ecumenists, I would say. Greek was the. Uh, which, language. you know, it's like, like the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, the great Roman philosopher, he wrote in the Greek language. He didn't write in the Latin language. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, of course there were Latin-speaking people like Seneca and others that wrote in the Latin language, but Greek became the universal the language. The it became yeah. like English is today. Right, throughout the world. Yeah. Uh, since, you know, we focus a lot of times on the pessimism <laughs> of the issue, but I think one well, interesting note prior to ending the show is also to just state, and I, I hope I'm correcting this, but despite all this, this there's still a continuity and the continuity of what it, what it means to be Roman, I think, still exists today. Oh, okay. So you're saying that the, the we may not be able to tell who the Franks are today. It's very difficult the, to tell which either is, but... But it, there are some Romans left in absolutely. the world today, and uh, they would be? Well, I, I think, it, <laughs> <laughs> I would hope at least that, uh, you know, what it means to be Roman still survives within the Orthodox Church. In the Orthodox Church. So it's not a racial th or ethnic. Not at all. It's, a, it's an idea, it's a culture, it's a religion, it's a way of life. Right. It's. Uh, uh, to be Roman is not to be uh, wearing a toga and uh, no. have Latin No, it's, it's the ideals that the Roman Empire stood for, the, the, the idea of a Christian empire, a, a, a Christian worldview, a Christian nation. Of whatever uh, color, whatever race. National whatever, identity, oh, well, ethnic, whatever, ethnic identity. Whatever ethnic yeah. identity right. may be. And that uh, this was the, the, the uh, salvation of this empire would be the Orthodox Christian, or the, really the Christian church. The Christian church. Yes. Which is the institution of... Uh, the, the most important institution within that nation. Yeah. And it survives in the Roman patriarchates that are still in, in left. Constantinople and other areas. Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria mm -hmm. are still, or really what is left, the tiny bit that is left of the Roman Empire. And to this day in those areas, in a lot of those areas, and specifically in Constantinople, where uh, predominantly a Turkish Muslim population exists, they still refer to the Orthodox Christians, predominantly who were Hellenic, who lived there pr prior as uh, Romans, as Rum. Romans. Yeah. Romans, as, as the Palestinian Orthodox, who are not Arabs, who, <laughs> that's another thing that, uh, <laughs> that blew me away, that, that the Palestinians are not really Arabs, they're really descendants of the Roman Christians, the Roman Orthodox Christians, who now have learned to speak Arabic over the centuries, and they call themselves the Rum Orthodox. Roman Orthodox. Right. So, uh, I think we're about ready to wrap up. Uh, this is Orthodox Christian Television. I want to thank Vasily Vignadis, Michael Halford, I'm Father Christobulos. Orthodox Christian Television is on every Saturday at 7.30 and every Sunday at 3.30. Thank you for watching.
Hello, welcome to Orthodox Christian Television. I'm Father Christodoulos. You'll be seeing this program during uh, post paschal time, so I say Christos Anesti. Today we're going to have another panel discussion, continuing the format that I introduced last month. The discussion again will be today the schism that Christianity finds itself in today. Why is there an Orthodox Church? Why is there a Roman Catholic Church? Why are there 20 different thousand Protestant denominations? There's a book that explains the origins of this chaos in the, in the Christian world. The name of the book is Franks, Romans, Feudalism, and Doctrine by Father John S. Romanides. Father John titled his book, uh, gave a subtitle to the book, An Interplay Between Theology and Society. And I have on the panel again uh, Vasily Bignaris and a Michael Halford. Welcome again. Thank you, Father. Thank you for having us. The discussion uh, last time, last month, we, we were talking about w how there's a split in the Christian world, how there's an Orthodox world, an Orthodox Church, a Roman Catholic Church, and many of these thousands of Protestant churches. We discussed that it was really not a, uh, a split within the church itself, that it was basically uh, one, a one-world church, or, or an Orthodox church in the Roman Empire that was conquered in pieces and, and that's how the church split up. Maybe you, one of you wants to jump in and recap sure. basically what, what actually did we discuss. Remember, we're coming in the, from the ideas of, and contained in this book by Father John. Right. In broad terms, I think, uh, without going into uh, the specific details that we discussed last time, but I also have to say before discussing that, it's very interesting and it's important for the viewers to realize one of the main reasons why Father John is writing the book is to discuss the uh, the pretext for a proper union amongst Christians and, and this, this mentality that's prevailing today. Which is what we want, which is desirable. Right, exactly. But this mentality that's prevailing today that basically all these different denominations that are out there that you just mentioned, thousands of them, anybody basically creates their own, their own faith, uh, that they comprise the body of the church finally has to be uh, confronted. And I think that's what Father John is doing. He's trying to define the true nature of the body of the church. In other words, uh, to be a Christian doesn't mean uh, whatever you want it to be. In other words, uh, right. each, each individual who finds the Bible, who finds Christ's write, uh, apostles' writings, doesn't determine what the church is. The church is a, a definite uh, organization. It's a definite... With borders. It has borders. It has its organization. It has its dogmas and doctrines. And wh where that church is, is the controversy. And exactly. who, who that church is, or what is that the true version of that church. And what Father John is doing, you're saying, is to get back to the origins of this, the, the split. He's, the, he's, he's, uh, he's actually discussing this on its real uh, face, basically, the issue at hand, where it should be discussed, and not at these false, basically, smokescreen issues that are being discussed these days, mostly, uh, around us. Well, let's, um, let's, look at, let's look at this geographically, geographically for a minute. We have, we have in the world, uh, in, the, in the early Christian world, uh, an empire that comprised basically uh, what's called the, the Mediterranean Sea and the areas around the Mediterranean Sea. The Roman Lake, the Mare uh, Romanum, as the, Latin, the Romans called it, the, the Mediterranean Lake, the Mediterranean, the Roman Sea. This empire, w when it became Christianized, was basically an Orthodox Christian empire, is what Father John is saying. It was an Orthodox Christian empire. Early on, it, you know, it started off with just a few Christians, population-wise, but then it spread until to be a Roman was to be a Christian, and to be a Christian was to be a Roman. And this is where the problem arises. This is where the, uh, the controversy arises. Michael, the, you're dying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's interesting to note uh, that in uh, all the discussions about the conflicts between Christians, one of the key issues which is left out is this notion of a, of a Christian empire, this notion of Christian unity, this notion of a multi-ethnic kind of, uh, with a common, uh, a common unity of Christianity. And in all the discussions of, uh, you know, of, of Christianity, this history of Christianity. Uh, the history of Christianity, this notion of Christian unity based upon the, the, the model of the Roman Empire, the model of a, of a common culture, a common Christian culture, and, you know, that idea is somehow missing. And so what instead we have is these notions of, of agree to disagree. Okay. Let's not go back to the common uh, history of Christianity. Let's not go back to a common vision of the world, to a common culture. Let's agree to disagree. 
Well, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that common culture, to that Roman nation. Look, what happened? What happened to the, the church that was a national church? It was a unified national church in the Roman nation. What happened to that? How did it break up into a million pieces? Well, in successive waves of, uh, of, uh, of conquering, the uh, Franks or the uh, Germanic tribes which conquered the Roman Empire in successive stages, they, found, you know, they divided the empire as one divides spoils in, in a war. And uh, the territory that they eventually gained control over uh, has now become the uh, modern uh, w Roman Catholic Church. Or and later, and later, of course, the Reformation. Were, the Reformation uh, further splintered that into uh, the thousands of Protestant denominations we all see today. But when does uh, Father John, in his book, explain uh, did this first start happening? When did the Roman Empire first start being conquered by the Franks? Well, he said it was very early, like in the 400s. In the 400s. I guess in different parts of the empire, yeah. it happened at different times. That's correct. The, and it culminated when finally when the, the, the papacy or the, the patriarch and bishop of Rome was turned into a Frank. That's correct. Let, let's let's uh, back, go ahead. If I could just cut you off, yeah, Father. Cut it's, off any time. Feel really free important. to cut off any time, Michael. And I think it's real important just to emphasize what you just said uh, because, you know, like I said earlier, we, we misunderstand the nature of the conflict and the debate these days. You just said when the papacy was basically turned and taken over uh, by a Frank, and it's interesting to note the uh, orthodoxy of the papacy, the uh, orthodoxy of the Bishop of Rome pre that taking over of the papacy. Basically, uh, the Pope at many times, and specifically right before these conflicts uh, and divisions occurred, saved you know, the orthodox world from he certain heresies and defended against heresies. So I think it's important to note that the situation that exists today did not exist back then. The Pope, the Bishop of Rome, was part of that body, the church, the Orthodox Church, that was called the Catholic and Apostolic Church, and which, and which still exists today, of course. So, ba so basically what Father John is saying is that the Orthodox Church is the Roman Catholic Church, that it is the Roman Church, because it's the descendant of that national church that was right. the national ch religion of the Roman nation, so therefore it's Roman, and it's the Catholic Church because Catholic is the universal church that the Apostles founded. So that, in a way, the Orthodox Church is the Roman Catholic Church, and he calls the what the, is known as the Roman Catholic Church today. He calls it the Latin or right. Frankish Church. I suspect people. So, are, uh, so basically, what happened was the Roman Empire was conquered in bits and pieces, uh, all over the all over its borders, but in a big chunk of it was conquered by Teutonic or Germanic tribes, mainly by Frankish tribes and their their allies in the West. And when these Franks came in and conquered the Roman nation, it took the religion that was found there, the, the Orthodox Christian religion, a therapeutic religion, as he says in the second chapter, uh, turned the, that therapeutic system of therapy, or system of the churches as a system of hospitals, as he calls it, into a legal system used to oppress the people and, and pacify them and keep them from rebelling against their Frankish feudalism, which is what was established in Western Europe, Frankish feudalism, a, a, a variation of a feudalism that had never been seen until the Franks conquered the Romans. Feudalism always existed in We always will, but that particular brand of feudalism. No, but he, he argues that it was a uh, specifically designed institution whose sole purpose was, uh, was to obliterate the uh, Roman. existing Roman culture and to create a new culture on the ruins of that uh, Roman culture it conquered. And yet he still tr called it Roman. He tried, as we see in this map here, it was called the Holy Roman Empire, this Frankish empire that obliterated or attempted to obliterate Romanism and Roman orthodoxy continued to try to call itself Roman. Of course. And we know what Voltaire said about it. It wasn't holy, it wasn't <laughs> Roman, and, and it wasn't an empire. What, what do you think were the primary means uh, by which they try to accomplish that as far as obliterating the, uh, the Well, the first was, you know, a, a, as Romanides discusses at great length in the book, was, that, uh, was the notion of suppression of, of, of the Greek language and the fact that uh, by the institution of Latin as the mandatory liturgical language, the mandatory language of the worship in the church, it, uh, the knowledge of Greek died out. And the Greek culture, which was indigenous to Gaul, which is now modern France, and to much of the southern part of the empire, which bordered the Mediterranean, that culture was obliterated and destroyed and replaced by a Latin culture. 
a culture in which Latin was the primary language. And then so the myth of the Latin West and the Greek East was born. In other words, the Roman Empire had a heavy Hellenic presence, a heavy Greek presence in its culture. Obviously. The, obviously. And that it was this Greek presence that uh, Charlemagne and his Franks tried to obliterate. And this is one of the things that, you know, which, which was very interesting. You know, anyone who reads the Bible knows that the, uh, Paul wrote an epistle to the Romans. And, you know, one of the ironies, which never clicked till I read Roman in his book, was that the, Paul wrote an epistle to the Romans, to the citizens of Rome in the Greek language, but why not in the not, Latin language. Why would he have done that, right? Because Greek was the language that all Romans spoke. If, even if they spoke Latin or Celtic exactly. or whatever they spoke, they also most likely spoke Greek. So to be sure that they understood it, he, he wrote to them in Greek. So this, so this Greek East, or Byzantine Greek East, and Latin Roman West is a fabrication of, of the Franks, of Charlemagne, in order to divide the Romans that he conquered in the West from the Romans that, that were still free in the East, in order to break any ties culturally and religiously between so, them to, to, uh, so, as a means of oppression. And to inherit the title of, of Roman Emperor, basically, or the... Uh, well, that was part of his, I guess that was part of his, uh, part of the propaganda. Right. That he, that those, those, uh, and essentially the same propaganda uh, is being uh, propagated in most universities today. I mean, if you go to any university today and uh, study history, you're going to find that uh, they teach basically the Frankish line. The, that, well, let's, let's take what's happening now in the, in the Metropolitan Museum. You have a, an exhibit there of what's called glory, the glory of Byzantium. What, what, we, what would Father John Romanides, if he came to New York, <laughs> say, <laughs> say if he saw that banner? Well, he would say, quite simply, there was never any place called Byzantium. There was never any empire called Byzantium. These people called themselves Romans until the day the Turks came into Constantinople and, and, and destroyed the, uh, what was left of the, uh, of the Roman Empire. Actually, he told me in a conversation once that they called themselves Romans where his family comes from in Anatolia, in current-day Turkey. They called themselves Romans until they got to this country, and the, the quote-unquote Greeks that were already living here said, to, to, said uh, what do you mean you're Romans? You're not Romans, you're Greeks. You speak Greek, you're, you're from Turkey, you must be Greeks. And they said, no, we're Romans. What do you mean uh, Greeks? Greeks are, uh, were Socrates and Aristotle than pagans. Right. What are you calling us, a pagan? And there were fist fights, he said. <laughs> you know. And one of the so, most shocking things for uh, contemporary uh, Greeks, for lack of a better word, well, at this point, for, so people can understand, uh, they don't really realize when you say to them, basically, Greek is a derogatory word. Greek is not what we essentially are. No, uh, it's not they take offense to it at first, but I, I think after you explain it to them and you give them the historical background, they begin to realize that it was basically something fabricated Charlemagnean times and, and after uh, in order to create that division and the breakup of a historical truth right, right. In order you know, to propagate. And, and in fact the language that the Greek, that the Roman Empire spoke which was uh, a form of Greek form of Greek they called that language Romaic the language of the Romans so they consider themselves to be Romans could we say uh, that Constantinople oh. was the capital of the Roman Empire and that Constantinople I mean, it was politically. I mean, Constantine moved the capital of the empire from Rome to uh, the city, the village of Byzantium, mm -hmm. and then it was wasn't called Constantinople. It was rarely called Constantinople when he, when he was building it, and soon after, it was always called New Rome. New Rome. That was the name of it, New Rome. That was the capital. It was later called the city of Constantine because he built it, so it became known as the city of Constantine. And, and also, in order to kind of uh, weed out the lies there or the distortions, basically, I don't want to use them lies. Let's just say distortions. Uh, Let's call them lies. Okay, fine, yeah. lies. <laughs> and a distortion may be unintentional, but an intentional okay, we could say an intentional distortion but, is a lie. Yes, but I just want, for the sake of the people, for example, who who might be saying certain things today, who are not saying them intentionally ah. because they basically bought into the whole theory right. that has been passed on from generation ignorance. to generation. Ignorance. Right. Yeah. Uh, Sincere. You can kind of weed out with the uh, issue of papal uh, infallibility mm -hmm. and primacy, actually, because. Uh, you know, prime, the whole primacy issue is misunderstood as well, based on the, uh, Christ's uh, admonition to Peter. Well, supposedly that Peter was going to be the prime... Ba on this rock I shall build my church, and the gates right. of Hades shall not prevail. And uh, the primacy of the Pope basically based on that quote, it's not really accurate in the sense that because of the administrative significance of Rome, old Rome at the time, the Bishop of Rome did have a, a level of significance above the, uh, the other bishops. Place of honor. Right. But only because of that, because of the administrative significance. Because it was the... The, the capital uh, of the empire at the time. At that time, the capital of the empire, before right. 325. Exactly. Right. But in fact, you know, when they moved... Exactly. When Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from 
Rome to the new Rome in, uh, Constantinople. in Constantinople, a large majority of the population of the city moved with them. If, if you could imagine taking the capital of this country, Washington, D.C., and by fiat deciding we're going to move it to uh, Iowa, yeah, to the then they would have to take all of the administrative offices, all of the government offices, all of those civil servants, and move them in mass to this new city which was being built to house the new capital. In that language that civil servants only know how to speak, that language would now be trans translated to Des Moines, yes. in Iowa. Yes. So you're saying then that a, a, an essentially, well, let's say a Greco-Roman city, yes. a, a Roman city with a Greek, a heavy Greek undertone, a very strong Greek uh, cultural undertone, was was transplanted from Italy to to the uh, Hellespont, to, to the Golden Horn there, uh, where Constantinople is today. And in fact, that was done precisely to create a non-pagan city, to create a new Christian city, a new Christian capital for the new Christian empire. A city built from bottom up to the glory of God to administer his empire. That's correct. An empire, well, that would at least be dedicated to, the, to, his, uh, to his honor. And you know, it's ironic that now they call that empire, that empire which was created to uh, dedicate to the a Christian idea of a Christian nation, a multi-ethnic Christian nation. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the same ideals that, um, that the American society strives for. Right. Uh, right, absolutely. Uh, that that uh, now is called foreign. It's called Byzantine. It's, uh, well, it's an insult. Byzantine is to be uh, scheme, deceitful. Byzantine deceitful. Scheme. And to be frank, to be fr uh, frank is to be honest right. and straightforward and upfront. And you know, it surprises me how few people actually know that there existed a Byzantine Empire, that, there, that the Roman Empire didn't cease to exist, that the entire uh, world did not go into the Dark Ages, into the Middle Ages. That at the height, what was going on in Europe and in, in feudal society, uh, with all of the Dark Ages and the loss of knowledge, the loss of culture, that in, in the East, the Roman Empire was thriving. There were great universities, great hospitals, great, uh, great sure. enlightenment. In other words, the fall of the Roman Empire in 410 is what we're all taught and, and what most people believe happened. The Roman Empire the cessation fell. Cessation thereof, yeah. yeah. 410. And that, uh, I mean, often, you, not often, but every now and then you'll hear about the Eastern Roman Empire. But very few people above, uh, below the level of uh, university level are, are ever taught that. So, so the propaganda and this, this lie, this distortion is still a part of us. It's still with us today. And that's what we're trying, that's what Father John is trying to do with his lectures and, and, and his writings is to at least get, at least the, the, the people who are willing to hear this to understand the truth of history. Let's get a little bit to the uh, spirituality of what the Franks did, to the That's spirituality key. of the Romans, of the, of the Greco-Roman world. Let's not, uh, for the Greek people who are watching, the ethnically Greek people, let's not, let's just make it clear that we're not saying that, that uh, the Greeks disappeared with Socrates and Aristotle. The pagan Greeks did it, but the, the culture, the classical culture of, of, of Hellas, the classical culture, culture of the Hellenes, of the Greeks, lived on and, and was spread to the world through the Roman Empire. So basically the Roman Empire was a Greco or Helleno-Roman world. It was not purely Greek, it was not purely Latin. You can't say that it was a Latin West and a Greek East and that the two finally went their separate ways and that's why you had the split in the church. That's not what happened. So to the Greeks watching, uh, it, we're not trying to say that, that they're Greek culture and that they're not Greeks. We're just trying to say that the, Ro their, the Roman world was essentially uh, carried, uh, what it did was it carried the Hellenic culture to the rest of the world. Right, exactly. And this was a multi-ethnic culture that included Greeks, included Serbs, included to a lesser degree Slavs, but to a great degree Latins and, and uh, the Africans uh, of the northern part of Africa, Celts, Gaul, Gallic people, and Hispanics. Which most people leave out many times, the African... Uh, uh, the Numidians were Africans. Right, you know, the, the, the Coptic people today uh, were for a long time members of the Roman nation. Right. Their orthodoxy is disputed today, but they consider themselves orthodox. But the Coptic people were, were uh, part of the Roman Empire, and they're Africans, there's no doubt about it. So let's get to the spirituality. What did the Franks do when they came into the Roman Empire and found this therapeutic spirituality that was there to heal man of his spiritual illness? Well, for them it seemed a, a useless enterprise, a, a useless uh, institution, because they wanted a, a system of control, a means of keeping their conquered people under check. So they took the sacramental system, which was basically a system for providing progressive healing, and they turned that into a, a system of oppression by which bishops, priests, and clergy then, uh, by virtue of their or office. office, 
had the power to either send you to hell or send you to heaven. So it, uh, it, you, know, you spent your entire life with the concern that if I upset this person in power, I'm going to go to I'm hell. I'm going to go to hell. So I better do whatever he says. I, I just have to say, I mean, before, before commenting on the specific, uh, you know, uh, changes that occurred uh, with the Frankish infiltration, let's say, of the Roman Empire, I just don't want the viewers to misunderstand as far as why we're talking about this tonight and why we discussed it the last program, because basically this is not a, uh, a discussion or a debate as to who's in power. It's not basically we're, we're here crying about the, uh, somebody taking our empire away. You know, mm -hmm. we keep on saying a Christian empire and a Christian nation, and fine, that's all fine and dandy, but that's not what we're really here to discuss tonight because, I mean, we're eventually going to lead to it. But the essence of the dispute and the essence and why it has uh, tremendous social implications, I feel, is because what you just called the therapeutic method, the methodology that existed, was stolen, was taken away and thrown. We're, lam we're lamenting the spiritual hospital. That exactly, the spiritual and the condition hospital. that mankind has fallen into because of that. And in fact, uh, the Christian church in the Roman Empire had the role of a hospital, a spiritual hospital. And uh, the priests and the bishops had the role of therapists or spiritual healers. And that aspect of, and role of the church was lost when the Franks take, uh, took control of the uh, Western Roman Empire. In other words, the, the, the Roman Empire, the political leaders of the Roman Empire embraced the church, supported the church, because they saw it as a, something beneficial to society. Something They may have been corruption, they may have been corrupt politicians, as we know there were horrible tyrants who were emperors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as a, as a whole, the church was supported because it was seen as a, as a means of enhancing society and, and fulfilling the uh, role of a spiritual hospital and, and improving man's place in the universe. Oh, absolutely. To speak of it strictly orthodox and, and Christian-wise, it was a way of saving man uh, to, to, is to become face-to-face -face with Christ at, uh, on the final judgment. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what... And when I was reading Romanidius, I mean, I, his first chapter was very long, and it's, it's sometimes it's very monotonous. Oh, I had to read it ten times It's very myself. difficult in keeping up with what he's saying, but at one point, when I basically reading the second chapter, him describing how uh, uh, a transformation occurring in society from a self-centered mentality and a prevailing mentality that was self-centered. Explain that, the self-centered. Well, in basically, words, you know, uh, if you take away this therapeutic aspect of the church, I mean, everything basically comes down to the survival of the fittest and who's going to control who, and basically who's going to make the most. And, and we see the culmination now, the climax, basically, of this mentality in our, in our own days, where I was speaking to someone earlier, it all comes down to profits and losses and, you know, how much you're going to make. Uh, and happiness is based on what today? I mean, on pleasure. Pleasure. In other words, happiness is what we're seeking after. Romanides, which is, this is what really he says blew me away. <laughs> yeah, this is what really blew me away in this book. Besides the whole his history that blew me away, the whole different, different slant on history than I had ever heard, what really blew me away even more, I mean, I was, can you imagine, I'm already confused, my world is completely turned upside down. <laughs> then, then he tells me that the, the real sickness and malady of humanity is that it's seeking after happiness. Yes. That, what? Well, we shouldn't be seeking after happiness? In I mean, fact, he argues that the, the role of the, of the Christian hospital is to make you uh, non-self-interested to make you not seek after happiness. Not seek after happiness. What are we supposed to be seeking after? After the good of other people. Or after Christ. Yes. Right. We seek after God and then when we find God, then whatever God is, yes. we, and we can't call it happiness, we can't call it sadness, whatever it is, that's what we'll be in, in union with. And, and, in with. and in line with the, the, uh, you know, the analogy of hospitals and therapy and all that, I basically, we can basically say the goal is uh, to just to maintain this parallelism the goal is healing, and the goal is to be healed, basically. And then once th those rare people in our own times who become healed, our their mission is to, to heal other people as well. And who are these people who have been healed? The saints. The saints. In the other words, the saint is just... Father John says that a saint is a normal person. He's just reached normalcy. What a, right. a, a, a human being normally is, is, is a saint. Mm -hmm. Or in other, in other words, a person who is no longer seeking after selfish happiness, a person who has union with God. He's got the vision of God or the experience of God. And that's what the Orthodox Church bases itself on, Father John explains, on the experience that the saints have with God. We don't base ourselves on the Bible. We don't base ourselves on, on uh, any, any specific series of dog dogmas or doctrines. We base the church on the experience that the saints have. The church is based on the experience that the saints have with I, God. I, I imagine uh, you're, you're stuck in a cave in utter darkness, and one of your people manages to climb to the surface and see light for the first time. 
And the orthodox understanding is those people that have climbed to the surface and seen life for the first time and have come back to describe it to us and to show us the way to, to, to find that light. And, and try to describe light to people who are blind and never seen light. How do you that describe that? That, that, that is the, ana the analogous situation in which we find ourselves in this world. We have uh, one minute left, and I just wanted to invite you both to come back again. Right. And what I'd like to do is continue our next discussion and more into the spirituality of the Orthodox Roman Orthodox Church as opposed to the spirituality of the Frankish Church and to compare how one is the legalistic me means of oppression and the other is a therapeutic system of healing and freeing people from their selfish, happiness-seeking illness. Uh, my name is Father Christodoulos. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to say it in English or in Greek. Father Christodoulos, Father Christodoulos. Uh, Michael Halford on my right and uh, Vasily Vinyadis <laughs> on my left. We welcome you back to Orthodox Christian Television. Thank you for watching. Father Christodoulos, welcome again to Orthodox Christian Television. Michael Halford and I will continue our discussion of this wonderful book called Frank's Romans, Feudalism and Doctrine by Father John S. Romanides. What we were discussing in the, this is the episode number three, in case you're following this discussion. This is the third episode. Uh, now with us tonight is Vasily, uh, who will join us in our next uh, program. We discussed, Michael, in the first two discussions of this book, basically the historical history of the church and, and, and the events leading up to the schism. And we basically uh, learned from reading Father John's book the, and, you know, doing our own homework, that the schism in the church really wasn't a schism within the church. It was really a schism within the empire or it was really a conflict between Romans, and, and the Roman Christian Church, or the Orthodox Church, and the Germanic tribe known as the Franks. The Franks being uh, the people that were mainly led by Charlemagne and Clovis and Pippin. These Franks, being illiterate barbarians, came into the western parts of the Roman Empire, conquered the civilization that they found there, and its therapeutic religion, its therapeutic system of hospitals known as the Church, changed it around and turned it into a, a legal system that was able to uh, make it easy for them to keep the people under control, mainly the Roman people. Mm -hmm. The Roman people, whether they were Gauls or Latins or, or Greeks or Hispanics or Celts, whatever they were, they were Romans, they were Orthodox Christians, 
And the Franks put an end to that. The Franks basically sent the western half of Europe into the Dark Ages. What we know as feudalism really was slavery. And they took the, the religion and changed it around. And that's what we're going to discuss tonight. We're going to discuss the part of the book, the second section of this book, which is called empirical versus speculative theology. We're going to, we discuss what the Franks did historically. What did they do historically, militarily, materially? Now let's discuss, all right, fine. They conquered the, the western half of the Roman Empire. Fine. But so what as far as the church is concerned? Does that make a difference to the church? What did they do to the church? What did they do to the spirituality? What did they do to people's souls? We know that they, what they did to their bodies, but what did they do to the soul of, of the Roman, of, of the European, or really of, of the world as the world knew it? back then, half of the civilized world. What, what is empirical versus specula speculative theology? I mean, Father John talks about that in the second section. What did the Franks do spiritually? Well, they took a religion which was um, primarily about the personal experience of the saints, which was a, a tradition of um, gradual and inevitable you know, therapeutic improvement. And they turned that into a rationalistic uh, religion of speculation. Okay, when you say, well, let, let's, let's get to the, the term of the, the chapter here, the, the, the label that Father John gives to this section, empirical versus speculative theology. Let, whose theology did the Roman Orthodox have and whose theology, did, which of those did the Franks have? Well, the, the uh, Roman Orthodox, of course, had an empirical, i.e., uh, it was based upon the living experience of the saints. So the saints, having experienced Christ? Having experienced Christ and having experienced what they called theoria, or the vision of God, uh, versus a, a kind of mental construct which the uh, Franks, uh, following up, you know, basically uh, Greek philosophy mm -hmm. and Greek rationalism, a, a theology based upon, you know, the, the mental processes in the, in the mind. Okay, so we're, what you're saying is that the Romans, whether they were Greeks or uh, Latins, these Romans and, and the, were exp the saints of the Roman Church, of the Orthodox Church, were experiencing God. That's correct. They were experiencing God, and the Franks did not have this experience. No, they didn't have the experience of God. It was not part of their were, tradition. And so uh, basically, you know, it became a, a means of, uh, of, of speculating, which is why he calls it speculation. You think of what speculation is. Speculation is, is using your mind to try to create knowledge about something of which you have no experience. So you have to use your imagination? Yes. Okay. So what are, what are some of the strange concepts that their imagination led them to? Well, among them is, is a rejection of, uh, of, of the therapeutic system of the church. They, you know, one of the things that w w was most interesting, uh, you know, people think that there was a, a natural causal development from the, uh, you know, uh, from the Middle Ages, you know, through this kind of rationalistic system. And, you know, what was fascinating to me about the book was coming to the realization that uh, there was no direct connection uh, to the ancient uh, pagan Greek philosophy. In fact, the church, for the most part, had rejected the pagan Greek philosophy. And that uh, the Franks, uh, of, you know, following St. Augustine, who, uh, as the show progresses, we can talk a little more about. About Augustine of Hippo. Yeah. Uh, they uh, adopted much of his methodology, much of his way of looking at scripture, much of his way of looking at the Christian experience, and that became for them the pattern by which they began to speculate about God. And this was largely due to the fact that uh, uh, you know they did not speak Greek, as we've discussed in previous programs. Their kind of uh, enmity against Greek culture, and uh, well, not not being Romans, they had no interest in being uh, in speaking Greek. No, because every true Roman spoke Greek, at and least every true educated Roman. That's correct. And every true uh, uh, Roman hierarch or bishop of the church would, would, would had to at least be familiar with Greek enough to be able to read the the, the fathers of the church. That's and, correct. And the Bible. And, and since they didn't read Greek and they didn't have access to the writings of the fathers of the church, and they couldn't read the scriptures in the original language. Uh, all they had was uh, the great Latin father, Augustine of Hippo. So they were able to understand Latin. That's correct. Okay. And L Augustine of Hippo wrote in Latin, who was not a God seer. In no. other words, he had no experience of God, no true experience of God. And he nor did he have an understanding of glorification 
or, or as the Orthodox, you know, the, the Greek term theosis, he did not have an understanding of theosis. He did not have an understanding of the therapeutic. Oh, wait, before we get to theosis, theosis. in other words, uh, you had, you had a, the Franks found a system of, of uh, hospitals where you had uh, a therapeutic system being spiritual hospitals where you had a therapeutic system that was able to purify people, that's purify correct. their hearts, so that they, they would have that, so that they would be led to the experience of God. That's the, in other words, they would the become saints of the vision of God, which uh, the vision of God, which is really the whole b basis of a Christian, uh, a Christian's life, and the whole basis, of the whole purpose of the church is to come to sainthood, is to come back to being normal, as Father John calls it. Yes. To be a normal human being is to be a saint. Yes, and that's the whole purpose of the church to lead people to sainthood, and that Franks didn't understand this. They saw the church as some kind of way of controlling people or some way of getting people to be fear heaven and fear hell and if you don't do this you're going to go to heaven and if you well don't they that. saw it as a means of control and they saw and looking at the institutions of the church they saw them in the uh, hierarchical structure of control that's all they understood you have to understand these were germanic warlike tribes illiterates illiterates really. and, and who understood power and understood that power meant control and that uh, A hierarchy meant control. They, they had no concept of, 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 of a therapeutic tradition. Now, w when these Frankish warlords came in and uh, fa found this therapeutic system, they fa saw no no use for it in their way. So they they made s they found no use for it in their conquests and in, in, in their, in their uh, desire to conquer and oppress and build a, build their the borders of their empire, expand the borders of their empire. So they had to make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. And Augustine fit into this plan. Augustine, ha not being a, a, a doctor, a spiritual doctor, a saint, or a or however we, you want to call a saint, they were able to uh, find something that was, uh, something that, that, that was useful. And what, what was the thing about Augustine that they liked so much that they found so useful? That's so malleable to, to their purposes. Well, there's so much in Augustine that they found malleable, but the, basically, the one of the major things they found was his notion of the all-powerful sovereign God. His the, the this whole theology of power, which okay. became the center of uh, you know Augustine's understanding that somehow you know God chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell through his arbitrary choice of will. So predestination, I think you're talking yeah. about predestination. Yes. So in other words, God, they believe that the all-powerful God predestined certain people to the damnation in hell and to others to the paradise of heaven. And that no matter what you say or do, you're already predestined. Well, like the, the you other. think like the, like the head of a, of a war, uh, you know, of a, a warlord or the head of a tribe. Right. That the, the, their view of God, you know, you know, uh, people have often talked about God. And, and, you know, God is a projection, you mm -hmm. know, uh, of our own Human minds. Human projection, yeah. And the God is a projection of our own experience. Mm -hmm. Well, when they read the scriptures and when they encountered God, He became a projection of what every manly characteristic that they considered, you know, to be uh, a virtue. Well, it's like what the ancient Greeks did. They created gods based on human on human uh, types. And that's the, that's the whole purpose uh, of speculative theology, is to take our human reason, our human understanding, and then to cr try to create a, an image of God based upon our own experience, uh, mental experience. Not, okay. And not this is really what Augustine was doing. I mean, Augustine was looking at nature, looking at the, using his mind, and looking at the world around him, and, and looking at the scriptures, reading the scriptures, and trying to understand who God was and trying to come to an experience of God using his mind, yes. which is not what orthodoxy teaches. What does orthodoxy teach about experiencing God? How do you experience God, and where do you experience well, Him? Well, you experience God in your heart, or as the later fathers called it, the noose of the noetic faculty. Father, yeah, Father John has translated the noose, the Greek term yeah. that the fathers use for the heart, the noose. He translates it as the noetic faculty of the heart. The heart. Now, what is this noetic faculty all about? What is its purpose? Its purpose is to experience, to have vision of, to have communion, to have union. You know, all of these various uh, terms, terms uh, uh, to have an experience of God. In other words, the brain is not possible. Well, the brain is involved that. in it because the brain is part of the person and it's the whole person that has an experience of God. And see, this is where Augustine and, and most of the West made a, 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 grave error. a grave error and a complete departure from the traditional patristic understanding of the faith is that it's the whole person that's involved in salvation. 
And God doesn't deal directly with your mind. He deals with the person. The person is a, a unity of body, soul, and spirit, and mind, and heart, mm -hmm. and sense, and emotion, and that uh, it's the whole person that's involved in this process. And the West... But in particular, we need to, we need to concentrate on the heart, I think. It's, it's there in the heart that we well, of course, to purif we have to purify that noetic faculty in order. In other words, the heart is the Father heart is the center. Wh of let's it. See, what does Father John say about it? He mentions it as a, a telescope. Well, here he says the heart, and not the brain, is the area in which the theologian is formed. And when he means by theologian, he means anyone who's going to experience God. Yes. In, the, in the in the fathers, when they talk about a theologian, they don't mean somebody who went to Holy Cross Seminary and got a degree in theology. No, they meant someone that had an they active saint, living experience and, yeah. of God, because they would say that the only True theologian is the saint, is the person that has a living experience okay, let me continue. of God. Right. The heart and not the brain is the area in which the theologian is formed. Theology includes the intellect, as all sciences do. He, he considers the church to be scientific, so that's why he says theology includes the intellect, as all sciences do. But it is in the heart that the intellect and all of man observes and experiences the rule of God. And that's another thing that the Franks under, misunderstood. And today's Protestants and Roman Catholics still translate parts of the Scripture as the rule of God, meaning like his worldly kingdom, his, his kingdom that you're going to have to be a part of, a citizen of. The rule of God in Greek meaning vas the vasilia of God doesn't mean the same thing, does it? No, it means, in fact, the subjugation to the will of God, to the rule of God. It means moving from the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of God. It's a... Uh, what, what you would call an existential change from one uh, sovereign mm -hmm. to another, moving, uh, in this case, from the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of the world, mm -hmm. as St. John world, says right. in his gospel, uh, to the kingdom of, to the kingdom of, uh, of Christ, right. to the kingdom of God, to, uh, re moving uh, you know, through a volitional act, moving yourself from one kingdom into the other. Can we also say that the va vasilia, or the rule of God, can also mean God's Glory, 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 or his whatever it is that he is. His uncreated, his uncreated. Created, there it is. His uncreated energies. Okay, uncreated energies, which we will, we will all experience sooner or later, and it's that rule or those uncreated energies of God that's going to be heaven or hell. And that's how the fathers understood those statements in the scripture, which talk about, you know, that every knee shall bow and every that that uh, you know the, uh, they interpret these in the West as some kind of a you know, this sovereign Lord with his sword coming and making everyone bow as though that, uh, you know, uh, right. this is the way. Rather than interpreting as the fathers interpreted it, 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 that we will all have an experience of God's glory, of God's uncreated energies. energies. And this experience will produce in us mm -hmm. this response of uh, either for heaven or for hell. So in other words, heaven and hell in the Frankish tradition are two different places. Yes. There, there's a place that God is going to send you for eternal damnation forever and ever and ever because you were a bad boy for 70 or 80 years, and then you're going to be thrown into a lake of fire, and you're yeah. going to burn forever. God's going to continuously punish you forever. I mean, can you imagine? I, I could never understand. I can imagine. I mean, how can you believe in a God who is going to just stand over you for eternity, watching you burn in hell in a lake of fire forever, for eternity, eternally? And then the other people over there in heaven and enjoying themselves or whatever happiness that they're experiencing forever and ever. What kind of God is that? In orthodoxy, we don't, we don't accept that. No. That's not what we're, we're striving for. No. What, what is the difference? What is heaven and hell in orthodoxy? <coughs> Getting back to this uncreated energies of God. Well, heaven is, is uh, and hell are your response to the uncreated energy of God. In other words, God's l love, if we can call yes, it God's, God's love. Yes, God's love. Uh, well, uh, that's one term. That's one the term. Fathers, the fathers don't say God is love. They'll say he's not love, but he is love. He's not... Uh, fire, but he is fire. And, and that's where the, the breakdown in speculative theology comes down. You know, the whole issue of specula speculation. Any words we use, any phraseology that we come up to describe God, any symbol we use, any metaphor that we, it, that we uh, any poetic term, any we, come poetic term we come up with is merely a pointer to God. Pointer. A pointer. It's not, and, and, and to believe that it has any real direct relationship to the uncreated God. Because one of the things... In other words, ter terminology, is, uh, uh, language, is, is a feeble attempt at pointing people to, to the, in the direction they need to turn 
and, and, and to begin the purification process so then they can directly experience God. That's correct. We need, we need language, we need uh, instruction, really, to, to purify our hearts, our noetic faculty, to cleanse it. It's like the noetic faculty, as Father John explains, it is a telescope. Yes. The heart is a telescope that light can shine through if it's polished and shine, focused, pointed in, the, pointed in the right direction at the right time of day, and then you'll see that star that you're looking for. Done. And that's what the therapies, where the therapies of the church come into play. That's where the sacraments, the, all the rules that you, uh, and, ru and regulations, if you will, of the church. And the disciplines of the church. The disciplines of the church. Like fasting. The purified, the fasting. And almsgiving. Almsgiving, and charity, and obedience, yes. humility. All these things that seem to be uh, on the one hand, the Franks could understand, misunderstood them as being, we have to obey, you know, the, the supreme leader, whoever he is, whether he's the, the pope or the bishop or the priest, or else we're going to go to hell. Yeah, but, you know, it's interesting. They but, took, yeah. they took uh, this understanding of obedience, which is it, it, like a doctor-patient relationship. The right. doctor gives you a medicine. If you're a wise patient, you take the medicine. Okay. If you're a foolish patient, you uh, don't take it. Okay. And... Uh, there was never this oppressive, uh, you know, you have to take it or you're going to hell. In one way, that's true. If you're not going to do what I tell you, you're going to continue being sick. Yes. You're not going to get better. But the so church... It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difference that is not always as obvious as you and I now understand it. To Father John, okay? The, what we're talking about, see, there's a fine line there that... It's, it's a difference that not everybody can understand. It's like, right away. It, it, and, and it's if you're like, an illiterate, Germanic, poor, illiterate person, you can easily misunderstand. It's, like, it. it's interesting because you know, one of the things that, that Augustine dwelled on particularly was his notion of, of the fall of Adam and Eve. Okay. He believed that when Adam uh, and Eve, when God gave the command, you shall eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and you sh shall surely die. Augustine if you believed eat from that tree, if you, you eat from that tree, die. yeah. Augustine believed that this was that God was saying, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, against my will, I will kill you. I will kill you. That's the difference between I will kill you and you will die. A and the fathers all understood this as a warning mm -hmm. that that if you go through certain actions, then it will result in certain negative consequences, and that God death eventually. Yes. Death. Which and is that, another thing. Yeah. And that God's view of man is not looking around for rules in, in order that he can punish them, but more like the uh, careful Caring. protector. The therapist, the, the healer. The therapist, the healer saying, don't do this, don't do that, because it's going to hurt you. That the Ten Commandments were not laws set down. Merely to, merely for their to, own sake. Merely for their own sake, but they were tools telling you, you want to live in harmony, you want to have a peaceful life, obey these laws. That's the Old Testament. Now, we can go even further. If you want to live a peaceful, harmonious life, obey these Old Testament laws. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but now, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, you'll have eternal life. life. If, you, if you take your uh, medicine, do your therapies, polish your noetic faculty telescope, and then when I find, when you finally have the vision of me, which everyone is going to have, the vision of it'll God. It'll be a vision of paradise. It'll be, it'll be uh, how does Father John describe the Holy Fathers is describing it? It'll be a vision of light yeah, rather than a, vi vision. a vision of, un of consuming fire. There's a di difference there. In other words, you either, you either suffer or you won't suffer. Now, speaking about happiness, are Orthodox Christians... Seeking after happiness? Is that what we're looking for? Is that what heaven is? Is, is it happiness that... Well, that was another thing, that uh, another problem with Augustine. Augustine believed that the goal of human life was to seek after happiness. This kind of platonic ideal, you know, uh, that I'm going to be in paradise and happy sitting among the daffodils playing my harp. You know, all of the images that people have of what heavens was supposed to be. And he says this is part of the sickness of man. This is what... Who's saying this? Uh, uh, Romanides was saying. Romanides is, exp is, a, is, is expressing explaining the, that Augustine's idea of happiness is the main s problem um, of society today. Yes, it's the main sickness. It's one of the sicknesses that happiness is happiness seeking. Yes, that that produces much of the evil in the world. In other words, people are out there seeking after ha too much happiness, rather than seeking after God, seeking after love of neighbors, seeking after self-sacrifice. You know, the, if you read... Well, seeking, seeking after self-sacrifice is part of the therapy, I think, yes. that leads us to the vision of God, God yes. which is a kind of a joy that can, you really can't describe it as happiness. No. It, see, happiness is, a, is a, a, a trite, petty experience that human beings have, not to do away with happiness. We all like to be happy. It's, a, it's almost like a drug. 
but it's something that Augustine has turned into the purpose of existence yeah. for human beings. And in fact, uh, it's enshrined in our own Declaration of Independence. What are the oh, right, right. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are the inalienable rights that are granted to us as people. That's, that's Augustinian, and that's, yeah. that's not orthodoxy. That's not Roman civilization, as the, the Franks unfortunately did not understand. Now, uh, let's get back to the uh, point you were making about, um, about Augustine, about uncreated energies. And what's the difference? Father John in here talks about the uncreated energies of God. What is that? What, are, what is that as opposed to the created energies of God? What do we experience when we experience God, when, we, when our noetic faculty has been purified? Well, this is a fundamental difference between Augustine and the, what we would consider the orthodox patristic tradition. Augustine believed that there was no direct communion between uh, d direct communication between the Father and the uh, and the okay. created universe. That in fact, uh, God created intermediaries. He created the. Say that again. Now, in other words, th there's no there's no similarity between God and creation. No, there's uh, no direct. Uh, there's no direct communion between God and creation. That in fact, uh, these epiphanies uh, throughout all of the Old Testament and with the fathers were, uh, since God, you know, He took the radically uh, dualistic notion that that God is ultimately transcendent. Who took that notion? Augustine. Augustine. That God is ultimately transcendent. And that there can be ultimately no uh, communion between God and man. Then what was the purpose of? Uh, what was the purpose of man, well, according to Augustine? If you can't have communion with God, then what are, we, what are you attempting to do with your life as a Christian? Well, you couldn't have communion with God in, in, in a direct sense. Okay. You could uh, have communion through uh, with His created uh, graces. His created graces. Okay. Then what is the Orthodox Christian saint experiencing? The Orthodox Christian saint is experiencing communion with God's uncreated energies. Uncreated energies. In That's other words, they're not a part of creation. They're not creation at all. They're not idols. They're not, they're uncreated. They're God's energies himself. That's they're right. not something that is temporarily made so that we can experience them, experience, experience them. And see, the Orthodox... Now let's wait. Uncreated energies as opposed to created energies. energies. We only have a few minutes left. I want to make this point. God's uh, uncreated, his, the difference between his essence and his energies is what I want to get at. Uh, in other words, we are not experiencing the essence of God when we become God experiences. When we, no, when we because saints. by essence, God is transcendent and uncreated. Right. So, but we can experience His energies. In other words, we can't look directly at the sun. No, but we can. But we feel can feel the, the heat of the sun. Right. We can see the light of the sun. We can see. The, we can experience the energies of the sun. That's correct. But we're not going to be able to experience the essence of the sun. That's correct. So, in, when we're experiencing God as a saint. What a saint is experiencing is just just those uncreated energies. Of That's God. correct. And Augustine didn't understand the difference between the essence and the uncreated energies. No, in of fact, God. he would would never make the distinction, that, uh, even that there were uh, there was a difference between essence and uncreated energies. In fact, uh, if you sat down with him and tried to explain to him uncreated energies, it would be because it didn't fit with this Platonic uh, Greek pagan uh, pagan idea, which he brought with him when he came into Christianity. So to wrap up in the first few minutes, we'll, we'll continue this discussion on our next program. Basically, what we're saying here is that you had a system of experiencers, a system where uh, God was being ex uh, experienced by doctors, and these doctors were leading the patients to that same experience. And the writings, the Bible, the, the, all these scriptures were basically, when astronomers look at the, the stars, they write down their experiences in a book. Yes. And then fellow human beings can pick up these books and then have that same experience of those stars. That's, that's basically what the Orthodox Church's scriptures are, the Bible and, 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 and the writings the of the Fathers. And, uh, Whereas in the West, and under the Frankish speculators, you have basically people who believe that the, that base their whole church on these writings themselves, that they believe that these writings are actually the Word of God, not about God themselves. <laughs> They're not... They well, they well that's why, you know, this whole notion of, the, uh, of, of infallibility of, of the written word is not part of the Orthodox tradition. Right. There, in other words, the written word is basically about God. It's, not, it's about revelation. It's not, not revelation, revelation itself, itself, yes. Which is not what the Western tradition teaches. No. And according to the Western tradi tradition, the Bible is the word of God himself. And that's why there's this confusion between uh, the word of God who is Christ, the logos of God. Okay. We've got to wrap up. Michael will pick this up from our, on our next program. Thank you for watching Orthodox Christian Television. Please uh, tune in next time. Thank you.